Wildcats. Good morning, Wildcats. Very well. Let's celebrate the Tom Tom Congo. Come on, let's put our hands together for them. You can do better than that. Good morning once again, and welcome to our Black History Month Assembly. At this time, I'd ask that everyone stand to your feet as we prepare for our invocation. Let us pray. Eternal and all-wise God, we pause first to say thank you. Lord, we thank you for your manifold grace and for your many blessings. We pray now, O oh God, that as we have gathered together to celebrate Black History Month, that you would come and tabernacle with your people. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we celebrate, that we would be better for the time that we have spent together, that we would go back out into the world stronger, wiser, more inspired by all that we have seen and heard in this place. Lord, for these and many of the blessings we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, let's welcome to the podium for our welcome and occasion, Dr. Hedley White, the Associate Professor from the School of Education, and we will follow the program as it is printed. Please welcome him as he comes. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Acting President William Berry and the men of Alpha Phi Alpha, distinguished guests and cherished members of the great Bethune-Cookman University. Welcome to our Black History Celebration. Today, we come together to honor and commemorate the invaluable contributions, indomitable spirit, and enduring legacy of black individuals throughout history. As we embark on this journey of remembrance and reflection, let us first acknowledge the significance of this occasion. Black History Month is not just a time to recall past struggles and triumphs. It is a beacon of hope, a testament to resilience, and a call to action. It is a time to celebrate the countless achievements and milestones that have been achieved despite the obstacles and injustices faced by black communities. In this pivotal moment, we are reminded of the words of Martin Luther King Jr who famously declared the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Indeed, the journey towards equality and justice has been long and arduous, but it is a journey marked by courage, perseverance, and an unwavering determination. Today, as we pay tribute to the heroes and heroines of black history, let us also recognize the importance of continuing their legacy. Let us strive to build a future where every individual, regardless of race or background, has the opportunity to thrive and succeed. Let us work tirelessly to dismantle systematic barriers and address the injustices that continue to plague our society. As we gather here today, let us not only celebrate the achievements of the past, but also recommit ourselves to the ongoing struggle for equality, justice, and dignity for all. Let us stand in solidarity with one another, united in our shared humanity and our unwavering belief in the power of hope and resilience. In the words of Maya Angelou, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. Together, let us forge ahead with courage and conviction, knowing that the journey towards a more just and equitable world is long, but with each step forward, we come closer to realizing the dream of freedom and equality for all. Thank you for joining us in this celebration of Black History Month. Let us honor the past, embrace the present, and shape the future together. Oh, yeah. 
his free sounds and loud as the rolling sea. Let every voice and sing a song. Let every voice and sing a song. Sing a song. Let every voice and sing a song. They sing the rising song. A final day begun. Let us march on.
Dr. Jelani M. Favors. A literal son of the North Carolina a and State University, he cut at least one or two of his literal teeth right there in the campus's grade school where he met his now lovely wife. This dedicated husband and proud father is a passionate educator, an award-winning author, and the Henry E. Fry Distinguished Professor of History at North Carolina a and State, where he also serves as the inaugural director for the Center of Excellence for Social Justice. The recipient of several major fellowships, including Humanity, Humanities Writ Large Fellow and serving as the Mellon HBCU Fellow at the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute, both at Duke University. Dr. Favors is the author of Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Foster Generations of Leadership and Activism, and is co-editor along with me and several other scholars of the forthcoming work, A Story to Tell, an encyclopedia of historically black colleges and universities. Now a little housekeeping. Uh, those of you who are here, many of you have been motivated by the competition Firstly, for the Provost Cup, and secondly, for that student scholarship. Any of the tickets that you got today, please do hold on to them, as there will be an announcement at 12 noon promptly tomorrow in the cafeteria of the winners. Now, following a very short video presentation message from our beloved founder, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, the next voice you will hear will be none other than national award-winning historian, author, educator, man of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and my brother in the struggle, Dr. Jelani Favors. Thank you. As I pin these words, I find myself speaking to you not just as students and alumni, but as my cherished children. This letter, an echo of my last will and testament, is my final gift to you. You, my children, are the living legacy of a dream that began many years ago. Each of you carries a spark of that dream within you, a flame nurtured by the hollowed howls of our beloved university. To you who walk the campus today, know that you are treading a path paved with the aspirations and triumphs of those who came before you. You are the embodiment of our hopes, the future that we have toiled so tirelessly to secure. And to you who have ventured forth from our nurturing grounds, Remember that you are forever a part of this family. Your successes and achievements are the fruits of a tree planted in fertile soil, watered with love, faith, and an unwavering belief in the power of education. Let your lives be a testament to the power of knowledge and the resilience of the human spirit. May this university always be a beacon of light guiding you through challenges and towards a future filled with promise and purpose. With all my love and blessings, Mary McLeod Bethune. Absolutely uh, incredible. I, I got chills going through my body hearing the words of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. I didn't know I had to follow those words and her essence and her spirit. Um, but again, it is absolutely incredible um, to stand before you in this sacred space. Uh, to Dr. Barry, uh, to Dr. Gregory, 
and other organizers and sponsors of this event, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for this invitation to be with you today. This is a dream come true for me. Uh, in my travels, in my research, I've had the honor and the opportunity to grace the campuses of many of our nation's finest HBCUs, but I've never been able to make it to the house that Bethune built until now. And what's interesting about that is that you can't study the legacy of black colleges in America and not encounter the long shadow of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. In every archive I went to, in every set of personal papers and memoirs I dug through to piece together Shelton or Thomas Thorne, she was there. Corresponding with various college presidents that she befriended, showing up on various campuses to address students and members of the community, she was always there. Indeed, I count it a privilege and an honor to stand before you in this sacred space today and to speak with you on an occasion that she held so dear, Black History Month. So let's go, Wildcats. I pray that my words today would make her proud and uphold the legacies that she fought so hard to advance. Having said that, I've been politely and subtly informed that the only thing standing between you and lunch is me. <laughs> so I promise to not hold you too long, but please allow me just a few minutes of your time to quickly dwell on the topic, the greatest art is the greatest propaganda, the value of the black aesthetic and the legacy of HBCUs. On the monitor before you, I hope that it's before you, um, is, the co is a copy of the cover of my book, Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and Activism. If that is not on the monitor in front of you, if you would indulge me and just take out your phones and Google Shelter in a Time of Storm and examine the book cover briefly, um, we're going to talk about that in just a second. I am taking a great risk in what I'm about to say next. And there is a chance that it may come off as one of the most anti-intellectual things that I've ever said. I have been blessed and fortunate to give talks and lectures across the country since the book came out. And I've always been extremely bothered that in all the questions that I fielded concerning shelter in a time of storm, no one, no one, has ever asked me about the cover. It's become a running joke in my household, so much so that my wife once logged into a virtual book talk I gave and tried to sneak a question into the chat about the cover just so she could shut me up from complaining about it. So while it is true that you should not judge a book by its cover, please allow me to, sus to suspend that log logic for a moment as I speak to you this morning. The cover of this book combines the legacies of two very powerful and influential women whose ties to the HBC universe run deep. The painting on the cover of that book is entitled A Second Generation, and it is the work of Elizabeth Catlett, one of my favorite artists of all time who was trained at Howard University. When I was sifting through potential artwork that could serve as the book cover, I knew that I wanted to find someone with an HBCU connection and one that adequately conveyed and captured the spirit of the book. When I came to this painting from Catlett, I was immediately arrested by the beauty and the vibrancy, but then I dug deeper to find the meaning behind the painting. In 1992, Catlett was commissioned to paint six lithographs in honor of her friend Margaret Walker's critically acclaimed and widely celebrated 1937 poem entitled, For My People. A stanza from that poem reads, Let a new earth rise, 
Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. Much like Mary McLeod Bethune, Margaret Walker cast a long shadow in my work, and her powerful diaries became a centerpiece in the primary sources that I consulted to write my chapter on the history of Jackson State University. So to find out that one of my favorite artists, Elizabeth Catlett, had an enduring and long-lasting friendship with a scholar, writer, and educator that I profoundly admired and got to know during my research on Jackson State was truly a moment of divine providence for me and let me know that I had indeed settled on the perfect cover for a shelter in a time of storm. Walker became a towering figure in black literature and one of the most celebrated poets during the latter years of the Harlem Renaissance. And in 1949, she accepted a teaching position at Jackson State University, a move that would greatly impact her personal and professional life. The lives of Catlett and Walker illustrate the significant impact of black colleges in the Harlem Renaissance and beyond. HBCU served as a touchstone of the black aesthetic, training countless artists, playwrights, poets, and musicians who translated the promise and pain of black America through their work. Langston Hughes honed his talents as a student at Lincoln University. Zora Neale Hurston worked out her frustrations against white supremacy in the pages of the stylus. Howard University's newsletter for their literary club. And as a student at Dillard in New Orleans, a young and precocious Margaret Walker fell in love with poetry and creative writing that framed the joy and the sorrows of the black experience. Of that experience, Walker would later comment, now so far as social message is concerned, I personally believe that black people need to preach in their work, but to preach so subtly that you don't think of it as preaching. The greatest art is the greatest propaganda, but the greatest propaganda is not necessarily the greatest art. I believe that the novelist is a social historian. By the way, Dr. DeGregory, you will be proud to know that I uncovered this powerful quote from Walker in the archives of your alma mater, Fisk University. So shout out to Fisk and all the Fiskites who may be present. Indeed, HBCU archives matter. But let's dwell on the words of Walker for a moment if we can. The greatest art is the greatest propaganda, but the greatest propaganda is not necessarily the greatest art. HBCUs have provided generations of black youth with the intellectual tools to help craft and shape the black aesthetic. Black students attending HBCUs and black youth in general have always been the avant-garde of what is cool. You defined what is trending, what's in style, and what is not. The cultural pageantry that we produce within these spaces have been imitated but never duplicated. Long before the phrase black girl magic and black boy joy ever existed, Bethune Cookman carved out space where we could dream, where we could imagine, where we could create and be free in a world that sought to exploit and to extinguish our light. And that sliver of space, these shelters in a time of storm, not only served as vital sources 
and space for our creative energies, they also uplifted our freedom dreams. Black college administrators and faculty members like Margaret Walker understood that great art could indeed be great propaganda. For several generations, HBCU faculty perfected teaching as art, mentoring as art, nurturing as art. How else could they counter the effects of a white supremacist society that sold pseudo-scientific ideas that black youth were coons and piccaninnies and inherently criminal and destined for a life of second-class citizenship and servitude. This was the dominant mainstream narrative of American life for years, and it lived in media and nefarious and false, uh, false artistic impressions of black life in early film, and it was taught and embraced in segregated school, white schools, and perhaps most importantly of all, it shaped policy. Policy that marginalized and undercut African-American ambition and enshrined in American law that black lives do not matter. But we are thankful for the shelter. I say it again. We are thankful for the shelter. Within this sacred space, Black college faculty, regardless of their field or academic background, work as artists, preaching subtly in their work and engaging in a skillful propaganda that reversed the corrosive narrative of white supremacy and taught black youth, as Langston Hughes once boldly and brilliantly stated, that they too sing America. In 1929, Solomon Say, a young minister who would go on to become one of Alabama's most important freedom fighters, enrolled at Alabama State University. Allow me to illustrate the power of the HBCU propaganda by sharing a portion of his story as was written in my book, Shelter in a Time of Storm. Say was an itinerant preacher, itinerant preacher with the AME Zion Church who enrolled in colleges while he could, picking up a course or two along the way. About all that I can remember from that experience, wrote Say of Alabama State University, is two courses that did something special to me. As was often the case, Say's classes in, quote, rural sociology and human geography didn't scream militant coursework. Such was the magic of the HBCU propaganda. Say's professors had the opportunity to close their doors, begin their instruction, and find ways to relate any course to the oppressive social, political, and economic conditions blacks suffered from. In doing so, they hoped that the outcome would be conscientious citizens at best, at least freedom fighters, at best. They hit the jackpot with Say. He said, quote, both courses helped to awaken me far more than either of those teachers could imagine, recalled Say. This was an additional motivation for my whole civil rights thrust in the years to come. Working within the HBCU trenches was never easy for black college faculty particularly as challenges mounted to the growing freedom struggle in the 1950s. Increasingly, Jim Crow legislature, legisla legis legislators suspected that some of this subtle preaching that emerged from HBCUs like Bethune-Cookman and empowered youth to see themselves as change agents could threaten the status quo. Once again, the life of Margaret Walker offers a powerful example of the strife that many HBCU faculty endured. She made the decision to stay in Mississippi, although it was one that she questioned quite frequently in her writings. Her conclusion to stay in the South was not unlike millions of other African Americans who felt a vested interest in the land of their mothers and fathers. 
Walker sat flustered and temporarily neutralized on the sidelines of the war against Jim Crow, impatiently waiting for her opportunity to act. In 1957, she angrily wrote in her diary, she said, quote, why don't we challenge them? Why don't we speak out? Why are we so cowardly? No one wants to admit that we are living under a blanket of fear with constant threats and undertones of violence. What if we open our mouths? We are threatened with our jobs, our homes, our lives. We cannot stay here and speak out. We must be silent or leave Mississippi. A revolution is surely taking place. Will we win the peace or lose as always in the past to the reactionaries? And again, that's 1957 from the diaries of Margaret Walker. Professor Walker decided to impact the freedom struggle by continuing to preach subtly to her students, many of whom would develop the courage to directly challenge Jim Crow in Mississippi in their elder's stead. She explored the intellectual parameters of her classroom, employing various teaching methods and utilizing creative imagery that fascinated her students. During the school's Diamond Jubilee Year celebration, Walker brought a litany of celebrated writers and artists to Jackson State to participate in forums and give presentations of their work. Among those writers presenting were Langston Hughes, Robert Hayden, Arna Bontemps, and of course, Alexander herself. As the decade drew to a close, Professor Alexander worked continuously on what would become her signature work, the classic novel, Jubilee. Any doubt that Walker possessed about her contributions to the movement soon dissipated with the unveiling of the Black Power Movement. To her delight, a new generation of Black writers and artists discovered many of her earlier works and were particularly drawn to her collection of poems, For My People. Ironically, Walker completed her novel, Jubilee, in 1966, the same year that the world was being introduced to the soaring and empowering rhetoric of the Black Power Movement. The themes of her new book immediately resonated with black radicals and artists and students seeking to tell their own stories through their own lenses. She retired in 1979, but not before establishing the Institute for the History, Life, and Culture of Black People that was later renamed the Margaret Walker Center. Black colleges have been a moral force for justice in our nation's history. In doing so, they've carved out a radically alternative path in higher education. HBCUs have produced artistic movements, intellectual movements, and freedom movements that have sought to cleanse the soul of this nation, and they have recognized and uplifted the humanity of others when few other institutions of higher learning did. The founders of Black History Month, the Association for the study of African American life and history, have asked us to dwell on the significance and contribution of black art this February. For any aspiring artists, musicians, or creatives out there, please allow me to leave you with three main takeaways that I believe Margaret Walker would endorse. One, be honest and true to yourself in your art. Never bend to societal pressures that would have you tell and present a false image of who you are. It has been said that 2024 is the year that we, quote, stand on business. Make sure that the business that you are standing on and the art that you are creating is an authentic reflection of your soul and not a facsimile of what you think society wants to hear or see. Dr. Bethune once said, be calm, be steadfast, and be courageous. I would also add, be true. Second, be honest and true to your ancestors and those who came before you in the application of your art. 
As Margaret Walker has reminded us, the greatest art is the greatest propaganda, but the greatest propaganda is not necessarily the greatest art. I don't want to get into the weeds of what all constitutes good art, but I will take the time to lift up the fact that the algorithms and the ad executives don't mind feeding us a steady stream of toxic propaganda that promotes insecurities about our sense of self and constantly has us shaming ourselves into believing that we are not enough, that uplift up the uplift of selfish tendencies that leave us worried about our own personal brands and our likes and our followers and what we need to do to increase them all is what's most important. And it also uplifts a culture of sex and guns and violence that dangerously promotes these values into mainstream popular culture. Again, I'm not here to judge the art that you choose to consume, but just know that we are more. We have always been more. Don't be afraid to use your art canvas to tell the beautiful, broad, and diverse stories of who we are. Lastly, cherish, value, and uplift the consecrated spaces that have made the creation of our art possible. In all my talks, that I've been fortunate enough to give over the last few years. I have championed this truism of our struggle for liberation. Black spaces matter. Mary McLeod Bethune knew this all too well when she first carved out the literary and industrial training school for Negro girls. She leaned into and invested in the freedom dreams of our people when she joined the National Association of Covered Women and later launched the National Council of Negro Women. She was the quintessential race woman who, con who concretely understood that we could not create if we don't have spaces free of white supremacy and bigotry in order to accomplish that goal. Like many HBCUs, this sacred space where we gather today has been battered and tossed and torn. But Bethune Cookman still stands. And this, amen. And this space where great art is achieved every day, it still matters. We should never forget, or we should never publicly defile that legacy. We should respect that. We need to honor that. And we need to invest in that so that Bethune Cookman will produce great leaders, great movements for social justice, and great art for generations to come. Thank you for your time. May God bless the legacy of our ancestors who we remember and celebrate this month and always. And may God bless the legacy and continuing work of Bethune-Cookman University. Thank you. Bradshaw, the proud vice president of Bethune-Cookman University Student Government Association. And alongside me stands my soror and your Miss Bethune-Cookman University, Donisha McFadden. Dr. Favors, could you please join us? On behalf of the administration, faculty, staff, and students of Bethune-Cookman University, and in the eternal spirit of our beloved founder, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to the esteemed Dr. Jelani Favors, whose words have ignited the flames of inspiration within us. Thank you so much. As 
As we bask in the glow of Dr. Favor's profound insights, let us remember that Bethune-Cookman University is more than a 120-year-old institution of higher education. It is a shelter in a time of storm where nothing is impossible. Please stand for the singing of our alma mater. Leading us will be our very own Bethune-Cookman Concert Chorale.